Good morning, Tri Lakes United Methodist Church, you hardy drivers and travelers, you. Thanks for joining us on this first Sunday of a new year. Um, officially, this Sunday is both Epiphany Sunday, the focus on the wise men, uh, but also Baptism of the Lord. We chose to focus on Epiphany last Sunday so we could really focus on the baptism of the Lord and remembrance of our own baptism today. And so if you're already looking at the bulletin and saying, hmm, this is different, don't panic. We'll be back to more normal next week. Uh, but the order of worship is a little bit different today. So um, I'm sure I'll get lost at least once or twice so we can uh, uh, all, all plow through it together. Um, as I mentioned, this week we are doing remembrance of baptism instead of communion. We'll talk more about that in the, in the sermon and as it comes up at the end of the service. Uh, but another announcement as well, we have uh, a new nine o'clock class beginning next week in room 102. It's uh, titled, If You Want to Walk on Water, You've Got to Get Out of the Boat. And it's a curriculum developed by uh, John Ortberg. Wonderful book and a great curriculum. Encourage you, if that's of interest to you, to uh, try it out. It involves uh, video clips and uh, some Bible study and some great discussion. So at nine o'clock, room 102, starting next week, I encourage you to do that. Uh, as we begin to uh, enter into our time of worship together, I invite you to stand in body or spirit as we speak together our call to worship. spoke light into being and called it good, as creation filled with life. God made us to love and to tend, and to be loved and tended to. When we lost our way, God sent Jesus, love incarnate, to bring us back to God. On the day Jesus came to be baptized, God declared, you are my son, Let us follow Jesus, remembering our own baptism. As God framed us as beloved children, part of the family of God. Amen. Amen. Our opening hymn this morning is Praise and Thanksgiving Be to God, number 604 in your hymnals, and the words will be up on the screen.
while you remain standing, I encourage you, let's turn to one another, greeting all and welcoming all to this hour of worship in Christ's name. We are a praying congregation here at Tri Lakes United Methodist Church. We believe in the importance and the power of prayer. Of course, we have our prayer wall. Uh, as you enter, you can see that, and you're welcome to put your prayer concerns, your joys, your requests on that board. We can also receive those via text or email through our app, or you can pick up the phone and let us know. We love to be in prayer with our congregation as we show our love for our family, our friends, our neighbors, and our world. As we enter into our time of prayer this day, I have a number of prayer concerns and requests and joys to share. We offer prayers for Ray and Don DeFelice, their son Daniel following his serious head injury. We offer prayers for Lee, uh, Lee, excuse me, Lisa Brookings, brother-in-law Lee's family. He passed away uh, just recently unexpectedly. We continue with prayers for Bob Embry with health concerns and prayers as well for Joy, uh, Joel, uh, the grandson-in-law of Bob and Penelope. Um, uh, he is being deployed to Syria. Uh, from our prayer wall, we join in offering prayers for an Uncle Tony who has been diagnosed with cancer and has about three months to live. We're asked to pray for his peace and comfort. We offer prayers for Ed Phila's stepfather, Larry, who is entering hospice. We offer prayers of thanksgiving for the remission of cancer for Brian Riley. We received word this week uh, from a, a, regarding a friend of our church family, Dick Davis, uh, his granddaughter Naomi passed away this past week. Offer prayers please for Dick and his family. And we, uh, as you know, take time to pray for our neighboring United Methodist churches. This week we're going to lift up a non-United Methodist church but with connections to us here at TLUMC. As we begin the new year, let's offer prayers for our friends and neighbors at Fellowship of Christ Global Methodist Church and for their new pastor, Stephen Graber. Do we have other joys or concerns to share as we enter into our time? Yes, Kristen. Okay. Bring that in our prayers. Thank you. Other joys or concerns to lift up this morning? Yes, I'm sorry. Well, just a, a joy because I uh, surprised Brian with a couple of friends from Phoenix. Well, he knew he was coming the other one, didn't he? Something I had in there, and he was so happy. But it boosted him because he knew everything he was coming. Yes, for everyone, traveling mercies, definitely. Other joys or concerns this morning? Yes. So just uh, prayers, uh, thanks both for those surgeries, recovered very well. Yes. And uh, also uh, prayers for Ashley, she's officially well. She's really well. Okay. <laughs> Other joys or concerns this morning? Yes. Thank you. Prayers for family, friends, and church for wisdom as well. Other joys or concerns? If not, let's gather together in our time of silent prayer as we lift up the joys and concerns that have been spoken, but bring to God as well those unspoken joys and concerns on our hearts. Let's come together now in a time of silent prayer. Oh, gracious and loving God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for the gift of this new day, but especially today, God, we thank you for the gift of a new year. As we see the days and weeks in front of us, we see almost boundless opportunities, but we see as well great challenges. 
Remind us, Lord, that you walk with us every step of our journey. We thank you, God, for hearing our prayers for those that we love, for those facing issues of their health, challenges in their life, issues with relationships. God, we pray truly that your presence, your spirit would be present in the midst of their pain and in their suffering and struggle. We pray too, God, that our eyes would be open so that we might truly be the hands of Christ in this world, extending your love into their lives as well. We offer prayers of thanksgiving this day, God, for the communities in which we live, for the blessings of our nation, for the city and state. We pray truly, God, for those who lead us and in this upcoming political season, for those who seek to lead us. We pray, Lord, that division and hatred would not be part of the upcoming months. We pray truly, God, that your spirit would be upon all of those seeking office and all of those choosing who receives authority and power. Help us hear words that we may not choose to hear, that we may not want to hear. And help those who are seeking that privilege remember that they are called to service, not to bless and benefit themselves. We pray, God, for all of those men and women who make our day-to-day -day lives possible, for those who wear the uniforms of police, firefighters, paramedics, and others. We thank you, God, for their willingness to serve, and we pray for your protection to be upon them. And of course, we pray as well for all of those men and women in our armed services. We thank you for their willingness to serve, for truly their willingness to sacrifice. We pray again that they might be protected. They might come home to those they love as their duties end. And as your children in this world, God, we pray for our world. We pray for peace where we can only see warfare. We pray for security and comfort where we know others experience displacement and oppression and homelessness. We pray for your bounty to be a part of all lives even where we see hunger and emptiness. God, let this be the year that our faith enables the hungry to find food, the homeless to find shelter. Let this be the year, God, that your peace comes in a new and powerful way into our world, but especially, God, into the hearts and lives of your beloved children. We pray all of these things in the name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.
Thank you, choir, for that beautiful anthem. And now, if uh, you would please rise for this morning's gospel reading, taken from Mark chapter 1, verses 4 through 11. So John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And the whole Judean region and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, the one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the strap of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the spirit descending like a dove upon him. And a voice came from the heavens, you are my son, the beloved, with you I am well pleased. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Please pray with me. Oh, gracious and loving God, As we begin this day, this year, hearing your word proclaimed, we would ask for open hearts and minds. Help us hear, help us receive, help us live your word and will for us this day, we ask in Christ's name. Amen. A pastor doesn't have to be in the pastoring business for too long before they start accumulating baptism blooper stories. Times when things in a baptism just don't go according to plans. Things like dropped baptismal fonts, hopefully not dropped babies. Squirming and crying babies are kind of standard issue, although squirming and crying adults are a little rarer, if not unheard of. The the classic baby that's sweet and smiling until the water touches their head and they then become this enraged little creature, hell-bent on revenge. Or the opposite of crying, very unhappy baby that becomes a gentle little lamb the moment he or she fills the water. I'd love to believe it's always a function of the spirit, and maybe it is sometimes, but I'm pretty sure gas and a general distrust of strangers comes into play too, for the children, that is. (laughs) Adam Hamilton, the, the senior pastor of the largest United Methodist Church in the country, it's located in suburban Kansas City, tells the tale of his most embarrassing baptism moment, which in his case was of course streamed to probably thousands of viewers and remains forever immortalized on video. His church, the United Methodist Church of the Resurrection, has five worship services at their main campus location every weekend. And once a month they do baptisms as part of each of those services. Anywhere from two to five people, usually babies or young children, are baptized at each of those services. And the incident he describes took place at the last service of the weekend on a Saturday night, a Sunday night, excuse me. I believe he'd, he'd done a couple of other baptisms for two of the younger children in the family, uh, this family that was presenting their children for baptism, and now it was time to baptize their baby. In the front of their sanctuary, which, by the way, seats about 3,800 people, ask me sometime what it costs to build, next to this beautiful baptismal font, they have a kind of table So any squirmy infants can be laid down on that to reduce the risk of dropping. Apparently this baby was quite a bit of a squirmer, so he placed him on the table and began the ritual. Clearly it had been a long day. So instead of starting out with the normal words of blessing the water, asking which name is to be given the child, all of that, he went over to the baby, raised his hands over him and said, we thank you God for the abundant blessing of this food in which we're about to partake. Nothing but silence echoed through the huge sanctuary. Finally, Hamilton, realizing what he'd just said, stammered to correct himself, and the parents, fortunately with a sense of humor, started to laugh uncontrollably, and then joined by the congregation. I guess you can laugh like that when you're confident that cannibalism is virtually never a part of the United Methodist ritual of baptism. My own biggest baptism fail took place when I was a pastor at a small church in West Denver, about my second or third year of ministry. 
It was an old historic building, over 100 years old at the time, and a lot of people in the community had had some connection or family connection with it over the years. I used to receive phone calls, something that had never happened before or since, claiming the right to be married for free in that building because their grandparents had been faithful members there 50 years before. And more than once, I got phone calls from people with no personal connection to the church asking to have their babies baptized in the church for that same reason. After talking to them, I almost always got the impression that they simply equated baptism with childhood immunizations. You know, something that had to be taken care of, checked off the list. That doesn't fit with my view or the United Methodist view of the sacrament of baptism. When it involves infants and young children, the parents make a vow to raise their children in the faith and and the congregation vows to uphold and walk alongside them as they do just that. That wasn't going to be the case. And when I explained that I wouldn't do a baptism just to have it checked off their to-do list and that reason why, they were never happy. They'd say family was expecting it. It was my duty, et cetera, et cetera. I'd, I'd offer to meet with them invite them to worship with us, become involved in the congregation, have them become a part of the church, and then we could talk about baptism. That would be appropriate. But for some reason, that idea was never of much interest. One couple was so mad at me, they filed a written complaint with my district superintendent who completely backed me up with what I was saying. But one day, a couple, it was the wife actually, called me with that same request. In their case, though, her great-grandfather had actually served as pastor to the church some 70 years before, and their grandmother was still an occasional part of the congregation there. She came to church occasionally, and the couple themselves were very involved in their Methodist church back in Oregon. It turned out the extended family was having a reunion in Denver in two weeks, and, and there would be a lot of people in town, and they wanted to do the baptism at our church so her grandmother could be present, and the family would have this connection with their history. They had three children, she told me, but only one needed to be baptized, a boy named Jonathan. She made her case with me, and I finally agreed to do the baptism in two weeks, provided they would come and meet with me 30 minutes before the service that day, so we could discuss everything in person. Of course, when that Sunday came, I watched the door and nobody meeting the description of the family came in 30 minutes before the service or 15 minutes before the service or when the service started. Oh, well, I thought to myself, the baptism's off. But then about five minutes after the service started, in walked the family the parents, three children, grandmother, and a half a dozen or so others, right at the point in the service where the bulletin said we were doing the baptism. I confess I was a little annoyed, so I didn't even let them sit down. I said, come on down to the chancel. We had the baptism font set up, so they all trooped down, stood around the font. I blessed the water uh, without accidentally doing an Adam Hamilton type of Thanksgiving for the meal. Then I grabbed the youngest son, about three years old or so it looked like, hoisted him up in my arms and turned and asked the parents, what name do you give this child? Everyone in the group up there was looking at me funny. And finally the mother responded, well, his name is Thomas, but it's Jonathan here who's supposed to actually be getting baptized. As calmly and pastorally as I could, I lowered Thomas to the floor. And since Jonathan was a pretty big six or seven-year-old, I just brought him over to stand beside me while we baptized him. Those parents, unlike the ones in Hamilton's story, didn't laugh. Though I could hear snickers from other parts of the church that day, especially the choir. (laughs) Hmm. And and they left before they'd even had a chance to... (laughs) properly thank me, or, or to receive the teddy bear and baptism certificate we had for Jonathan. I'm pretty sure they thought the mix-up was more to do with my lack of pastoral skills than their inability to show up on time so I could at least meet the one I was supposed to be baptizing. That did solidify my baptism policy in virtual concrete, though. I never again agreed to baptize a child whose family wasn't an active part of the congregation. I don't know if John the Baptist, uh, by the way, we Methodists have recently taken to calling him John the Baptizer to make it clear that we're not talking about him being an actual Baptist versus, say, a Methodist or a Presbyterian. (laughs) 
if John the baptizer had any interesting baptism incidents to tell before we meet him in this morning's gospel reading from Mark chapter one. But boy, did he ever have one after the events we're talking about. We met John actually before he was born in the accounts from Luke chapter one we looked at in the weeks leading up to Christmas. There we see his own miraculous conception and birth and and learn along with his parents, Elizabeth and Zechariah, that he is to be the voice crying out in the wilderness prophesied about in the Old Testament, the one preparing the way for the Messiah to come. And that's just where we meet him in our reading this morning from Mark. He's in the wilderness, in the middle of nowhere, hot, dry desert land dissected by the Jordan River and sitting hundreds of feet below sea level eventually emptying into the Dead Sea. The location is about 20 miles east of Jerusalem down some very steep and rocky terrain. However, it's only about six or so miles from Jericho, which at the time was a much larger city than Jerusalem. So that's likely where most of the crowds that Mark describes as gathering at the river, those listening to John and heeding his call to repent and be baptized came from. Now, John clearly didn't listen to any church growth strategists in crafting his message because it was basically, you're all a bunch of rotten sinners who need to repent, turn back to God, be baptized, and prepare your hearts for the Messiah who is coming. That may not be a message that gets the approval of church growth gurus, at least in our day, but but it's a message that sometimes people need to hear. And apparently that was really true for John and his ministry. Mark tells us the people are flocking there. Using hyperbole, he says that all of Judea and Jerusalem were showing up. A little overstated maybe, but, but clearly John's message is striking a chord and even attracting attention as far away as Jerusalem, even among the religious elite where it's not universally appreciated. Mark tells us John is, uh, well, a sort of peculiar looking man clothed in camel's hair clothing, wearing a large leather belt, and eating only locusts and wild honey. By the way, when we talked about this from Luke's prophecy before Christmas, I pleaded with you not to bring locusts and wild honey to our church family Christmas potluck. And I'm pleased to say no one did. Thank you. In any case, John's appearance is meant to call to mind, to the mind of those first century Jews hearing this account, the appearance of the prophet Elijah, whose role of prophecy and calling people to repentance, John is taking up. It also could describe someone who has taken on the vow of a Nazarite. That's a vow in Judaism that involves dress and diet and never drinking alcohol or even eating food that could accidentally ferment like grapes. He sounded strange appearing to our 21st century years, but he would have seemed strange yet strangely familiar to those hearing words, these words in those days. They would have better understood John's God-given role of preparing the way for the Christ. John talks about all of that in his preaching, telling the crowds that he isn't even worthy to untie the straps of the sandals of this one who is coming, this long-promised Messiah. Before Jesus even appears to him, John teaches the importance of genuine repentance and humility. That's a message that Jesus himself will continue. And then in verse 9, Jesus just shows up. Shows up to be baptized by John, a request that must have blown John's mind. Matthew's account of the scene tells of John protesting the idea, saying that he should be baptized by Jesus, not the other way around. But Jesus prevails because he knows this is a necessary part of what he is to do in the world, his ministry to the people of his day and ours. Of course, Jesus doesn't need to repent of his sin and turn back to God. He is the sinless son of God after all. But Jesus came into our world to be like us, to reveal God to us. And and before his ministry can start, two things have to happen. He needs to take on the identity that all who have faith in him will share in our common baptism. And he needs to face temptations like we do as well. We'll talk about that next Sunday. As Jesus emerges from the river bearing the mark of baptized, Mark says the heavens parted and the spirit descended on Jesus like a dove while God spoke 
those words that mark the beginning of Jesus' heavenly mission here on earth. You are my son, the beloved. With you, I am well pleased. So if Jesus was baptized to share an identity with those he was seeking to save in his day and in ours, why are we baptized? The United Methodist Church, along with most Protestant denominations, recognizes two sacraments or ordinances, as some churches call them, rituals that Jesus both took part in and directed that we should as well, communion and baptism. The official churchy definition of a sacrament is a ritual that is an outward and visible sign of an inward grace. In non-churchy language, it means that God gave us through Jesus physical means to remember, to experience what's happening on that invisible spiritual level within us. God, of course, knows our human nature far better than we even know it ourselves. God understands that sometimes words aren't fully absorbed, or if they are, they don't always remain with us forever. But memories that are attached to senses do stick around. Think about it. If I asked you to describe the smells of, say, your mother's or your grandmother's kitchen at Christmas time, or before family meals, for many of you, your mind would instantly recall not only the smells, but the entire scene, often including the faces, the taste of the food, maybe even some of the conversation involved. So to connect us more closely with these inward graces, that inner new birth and sanctification, growth in Christ that's going on invisibly within us, God gives us something tangible to connect to. With communion, which we're instructed to participate in regularly, we're blessed here at Trilex to celebrate it together almost every Sunday, and we'll resume that again next week. With communion, we see, we taste the bread and the wine, and we remember. We repeat communion. We come to the table together regularly, and we remember, and we're strengthened in our faith. But baptism for us, as it was for Jesus, is a one-time only thing. One time only because it's an eternal sacrament showing the grace of being accepted by God, incorporated into God's family and the church, and, and marking the beginning of our walk with Christ. We United Methodists believe that it's appropriate to baptize even infants because nobody, despite age or anything else, is excluded from God's love in Jesus Christ. Parents and sponsors or godparents make vows on behalf of their child, and the church promises to be there to support those vows. And the baptism, whether it's of a child or an adult, is meant to remind us that God's grace, God's salvation, is a work of God's, not ours. For United Methodists, baptism with babies and young children ideally is a three-part process, actually. First, the vows are offered on behalf of the baby or child at baptism. Second, the child is raised in conjunction with the church, being in Sunday school, learning about their faith, being introduced to their Savior. And then as they become youth, they're offered the opportunity to participate in confirmation, where they take a deep dive into how their faith is maturing, what it can mean for their life, and, and then they have a chance to confirm the vows that were made on their behalf when they were younger again, in front of the congregation. Just as sort of an ad, if, if any of you are parents or grandparents of youth in eighth grade or older who haven't been through confirmation, Sam will be starting our 2024 confirmation class in two weeks. There's a sign-up uh, out in the uh, great room, and you can contact Sam for more information as well. The reality for most of us is we were baptized before we could remember it. And even if we are baptized as believers, as youth or adults, we still need the occasional reminder that God has claimed us, redeemed us. So that's what we'll be doing today, remembering with the physical reminder of water. This isn't baptism. As I said, we only do that once. But it's meant to reconnect us with, or if you haven't yet been baptized, to joyfully anticipate our joining with Christ in obedience to God's call to the water. It's a great way, I think, to begin a new year. And I don't think I'll get too many arguments when I say that in our world today, we need every reminder we can get that God is still with us. After becoming convinced that salvation was a gift 
from God, by God's grace alone, through faith in Christ alone, not due to our own actions. Martin Luther in 1517 posted a series of arguments, theses, on the door of the Wittenberg Cathedral related to that idea. Needless to say, the powerful, especially the religiously powerful, were not pleased. In 1521, he was ordered to defend his argument in the city of Worms in Germany in a forum called a Diet. So just as a note, when you hear people talking about the Diet of Worms in relation to church history, now you know it has nothing to do with Martin Luther's weird eating habits. Diet of Worms, it kind of makes you hunger for locusts and honey somehow. That defense of his ideas, that diet of worms, actually turned into a church trial on heresy charges, and Luther, unsurprisingly, was convicted and sentenced to death. The tribunal granted him permission to return to Wittenberg, and on the way, a local prince who supported Luther absconded with him and hid him in his castle at Wartburg for most of the next year. Luther couldn't leave the castle, but he put the time to good use, proclaiming Uh, to those who were there and producing the first German translation of the New Testament. He also wrote that it was a time of struggle, of doubts. He talks about evil and despair appearing to him, taunting him in actual visible form at times as a devil or a, a demon. Where is God in all of this, he was questioning. If he was doing God's will and proclaiming the biblical gospel over the din of corruption of making the Bible available to all, why was God allowing these dark days and nights, these threats of death? One night as it reached its darkest climax, he wrote that he found himself face to face with a taunting devil. Finally, in despair, he picked up his inkwell, threw it at the figure, shouting, remember, I am baptized. I am baptized. What he was saying to the evil that haunted him and to himself was, remember, God has claimed me. God has claimed me. The dent in the wall of his room in the castle caused by that inkwell flying across the room is reportedly still visible. So while our individual circumstances are nothing like Luther's, our cry as followers of Jesus Christ should be the same. In good times, in hard and difficult times, remember, I am baptized. So today, we remember. Amen. Let's pray. Loving God, this day marks the beginning of a new year, but a new year in which we need to be reminded that you walk with us. We know, God, there will be wonderful days ahead, amazing opportunities and joy And we know as well, God, that there will be challenging and difficult times. May our time together, together at the water, remind us that you are with us. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. I told you I'd need to look and see what we were doing. There's a story told of a a Midwest church that had a a really active uh, ladies group, women's group, uh, very involved in supporting missions. And and one day they were uh, made aware of a new mission opportunity and were very excited about it. So they decided to raise money for this mission opportunity. They did what churches have done throughout the millennia and decided to have a bake sale. Um, The women in the church all baked dozens and dozens of cookies and they advertised it to the community, and they opened up, the doors opened up at 10 o'clock, and in strode the richest man in the community. He was officially a part of the church, um, not all that active, but he strode in, and he went up to the table, and he scowled, and he said, look at that. It says you can buy one dozen cookies for nine dollars, or three dozen cookies for thirty dollars. I pause here a moment to let you do the math. He said, that's, that's crazy, that's stupid. Why should it cost me $3 more to buy three dozen cookies instead of one dozen cookies three times? And the lady, ladies at the table looked at him and said, sir, that's the policy. Well, that got his goat. 
So he took out $9 and he said, give me a dozen chocolate chip cookies. So she smiled and gave him a dozen chocolate chip cookies and he gave her $9 and he turned around and walked five steps away and he came back, give me a dozen peanut butter cookies. So she gave him a dozen peanut butter cookies and she gave him the nine, he gave her the $9. And he did the same thing again. He came back, give me a dozen oatmeal cookies. So she gave him a dozen oatmeal cookies. He gave her $9 and he said, see, I just bought three dozen cookies for $27. You didn't fool me. And with that, he strode out arrogantly out of the room. And the lady turned to her assistant at the table and said, see, I told you that sign would cause people to buy more than one dozen cookies. <laughs> Sometimes it feels like churches are good at manipulating us out of our money. Uh, people tell me whenever the church talks about money, I feel kind of used, kind of manipulated. I hope that's not the case here. I know by your generosity, it's likely not. Because we talk about money because Jesus talked about money. I've mentioned before, Jesus talked more about money than any other topic, accepting the kingdom of God. And often the two were tied together. Our offering isn't our time to manipulate you into giving money. Our offering is your chance to consider how you've been blessed and how God is calling you to be a blessing with your time, your talent, and your treasure. It's in that spirit I invite our ushers forward and we will hear together our offertory prayer for today. Please pray with me. God of redemption and new life, we focus once more this day on the greatest gift ever given, Jesus our Savior. As he was baptized by John in the Jordan, we were able to share in his baptism and receive the promise of sharing in Jesus' resurrection. As we leave one year behind and look with hope to the new year ahead, help us to live and give of ourselves as those who know every day what a great gift we have been given. <clears throat> May it move us to give our whole selves more freely. In the name of Christ, our Savior and Redeemer, we pray. Amen.
I like to do this remembrance of baptism once a year to start off the year. To remember, just as I mentioned, that like Martin Luther, we need to remember we are baptized. We're God's beloved children. It's a great way to start a new year. Uh, the United Methodist Church, as I mentioned, recognizes two sacraments, communion and baptism. Communion we partake in regularly. Baptism is a once-in-a-lifetime event. The United Methodist Church does not rebaptize, So that's not what we're doing today. It's not baptism. It's a reminder of our baptism, which for most of us happened when we were children or infants. Today we remember and reaffirm the vows that were made for us by parents and others when we were baptized. All are welcome. For those not baptized yet, it's an anticipation of your baptism. If you are moved to seek baptism, I am happy to talk with you about that for yourself or your children. When it comes time to come forward for this remembrance of baptism, rather than communion this week, you'll have to come up the middle aisle here. You'll come up here and I'll be by this baptismal font. There I'll use the baptismal water to mark a sign of, your cross, of the cross either on your forehead or, or if you prefer, hold out your hand and I'll do it on the back of your hand as well. Hear now these words as we begin this service of congregational reaffirmation of baptism. Through the sacrament of baptism, we are invited into Christ's holy church. We are incorporated into God's mighty acts of salvation and given new birth through water and the spirit. All of this is God's gift to us, offered to us without price. Through the reaffirmation of our faith as we begin this new year, we renew the covenant declared at our baptism, acknowledge all that God continually does for us, and reaffirm our commitment to Christ's holy church. So I now direct these questions to you, our congregation. On behalf of the whole church, I ask you, do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of your sin? If so, answer, I do. Do you accept the freedom and power God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? If so, answer, I do. Do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, put the, your whole trust in his grace, and promise to serve him as your Lord in union with the church, which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races? If so, answer, I do. According to the grace given to you, will you remain faithful members of Christ's holy church and serve as Christ's representatives in this world? If so, answer, I will. Let us join together now in professing the Christian faith as contained in the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments. I ask you, do you believe in God the Father? I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Do you believe in Jesus Christ? I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Eternal Father, when nothing existed but chaos, you swept across the dark waters and brought forth light. In the days of Noah, you saved those on the ark through water. After the flood, you set in the clouds a rainbow. When you saw your people as slaves in Egypt, you led them to freedom through the sea. Their children you brought through the Jordan to the land which you promised. Sing to the Lord, all the earth. Tell of God's mercy each day. In the fullness of time, you sent Jesus, nurtured in the water of a womb. He was baptized by John and anointed by your spirit. He called his disciples to share in the baptism of his death and resurrection and to make disciples of all nations. Declare his works to the nations, his glory among all people. Pour out your Holy Spirit and by this gift of water, call to our remembrance the grace declared to us in our baptism. For you have washed away our sins and you clothe us with righteousness throughout our lives that dying and rising with Christ, we may share in his final victory. All praise to you, eternal Father, through your Son, Jesus Christ, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns forever. Amen. I invite you now to please come forward as you wish for the sign of reaffirmation of, baptized, of, baptizing, of baptism. Whether or not you've been baptized, you of course are welcome. Come up the center aisles and receive the mark of remembrance. 
remember that you are baptized and give thanks. Amen.
to join me in a very important prayer in our Methodist life together. It's called the Wesleyan Covenant Prayer. You'll find it in the bulletins or again projected on the screen. We speak this together, especially on this first Sunday, but I hope throughout the year as a reminder that following Christ means committing all. Let's say these words of the Wesleyan Covenant Prayer together. I am no longer my own, but yours. Put me to what you will. Rank me with whom you will. Put me to doing, put me to suffering. Let me be used by you or laid aside for you, exalted for you or brought low by you. Let me be full, let me be empty. Let me have all things, let me have nothing. I freely and joyfully give all things to your pleasure and use. And now, O oh glorious and blessed God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you are mine and I am yours. So be it. And the covenant which I have made on earth, let it be ratified in heaven. Amen. Indeed, we are God's and God is ours. Amen. I love that prayer, and we have as a gift for you when you leave today, that prayer laminated on a bookmark. I hope it can be a part of your life as well. Please be sure and take one of those from the ushers as we leave. And now I invite you to stand in body or spirit. Let's sing together our closing hymn, I Am Thine, O Lord. It's number 419 in the hymnal, I Am Thine, O Lord. forth from this place, remembering and being drawn nearer to our precious Lord. And as we go forth, receive these words of blessing and benediction. Loving God, we go from this place to begin a new day and a new year. And we go forth, God, knowing you walk with us. Today, we ask that you light our paths and guide our footsteps. Give us hearts to be true disciples of Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Mm -hmm.